Um, I'm Kathleen Morrison, Director of the Center for International Studies, and I'm happy to welcome you tonight to our CIS Distinguished Lecture Series, and uh, I hope you will help yourself, as I see people are, to the snacks and drinks uh, in the back of the room, both before and after the talk. Um, our speaker today is a senior research scholar at the Center for South Asian Studies at the University of Michigan, Stuart Gordon. Uh, Stuart is well known to many of us as a dis distinguished scholar of early modern Western India. And I'll say I first met him in 1990 uh, when we were both in India and when he was working um, then on Bharata history. And since then, as I watched with admiration and I must say a certain amount of awe, um, as his work has truly gone global, right? encompassing the entire Indian Ocean world and really expanding back to the full to the first few centuries CE and forward all the way really in some respects to the present. You can kind of map this uh, amazing trajectory of Stuart Gordon's work in books. So I'm going to just uh, lay that out for you. Uh, it's not comprehensive, but um, the new Cambridge History of India um, book in 1993, the Marathas, 1600 to 1818. In 1994, Marathas, Marauders, and State Formation in 18th Century India. In 2001, Robes and Honor, the Medieval World of Investiture. In 2002, Robes of Honor, Kilat in Pre-Colonial and Colonial India. Kind of a pair, I suppose. <laughs> yes. And then a lovely book, uh, When Asia Was the World, published in 2007, which um, presents accounts of personal journeys of travelers across Asia between about 500 and 1500, uh, focusing on various kinds of connections, religious, cultural, and economic. Um, and then another, another pair, you might say, both forthcoming, um, a book coming out this year called Shackles of Iron, Slavery in World History, um, which promises to help expand the study of slavery well beyond the, um, large, the highly discussed Atlantic world, uh, with discussions of ancient Athens, the East African slave trade to the Near East, and intent to India, uh, Barbary slavery, and even contemporary slavery. So, and if that isn't enough, uh, another book coming out this year, about which I think he'll be speaking today, uh, Routes, How the Pathways of, of Ideas and Goods Shaped Our World. So please welcome me, uh, join me in welcoming Stuart Gordon. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share uh, some work on comparative routes. I want to begin with something kind of fun. Everybody ready? Close your eyes. I'm going to call something out, and I want you to call out the first visual association that comes into your head, the first mental image, whether it's a movie, what you see, what you hear. OK? Are we ready? Eyes closed. First visual image that comes to hand. Route 66. OK, come on, one at a time. Cars, what kind of cars? Convertibles, where does it come from? OK, where does it go? OK, what else do you see? What do you see? That sign. OK, that sign. Describe that sign. Shield. Shield, yeah, what's on it? That's exactly right. Keep coming. What else do you see? All right, I'll give you one. Two-lane blacktop, right? Going off into the distance. Okay, what else do you see? Diner. 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 What's who's in the diner? Great. Truckers. Yeah, truckers? Yeah. Okay. Old motels. Old motels. What do they look like? One story. Yes, keep coming. Gas station. Yes. That's next to the that's next to the diner. Okay? What is the diner? What does the gas station look like? Rounded pumps. Great. Rounded pumps. Yeah? Full service. Full service. What kind of sign? Neon. Neon sign. Absolutely right. Keep coming. How many are the are the uh, is the motel large or small? Small. 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 How many units? Ten. 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 Twelve. Great. Keep coming. Town. Okay. Tiny, tiny little towns. Tiny little towns. Describe them. One road. One road. Traffic light? No. Railroad track. Railroad track. Railroad track. Great. Keep coming. All right. What? Post office. Post office. Yep. Desert. Desert. Desert all around. Okay. 
Now, last but not least, who's on the road? Motorcycles. Motorcycles, great. Keep coming, there's more. Families. Sorry? Families. Families. Where are they going? California. Yes. West. When does it date from? That image. 30. 30s, right. Why? Great Depression. Great, good job. Okay. We've got a pretty thorough embedded image of Route 66. Let's try it one more time. Close your eyes. Get ready. The first association that comes to mind, I-94. <laughs> Traffic. Let's see if we can get anything else. Trucks. Four lanes. Toll booths. Billboards. Billboards. Good. All right. Blue and red shield, not black and white. Okay. The point that I want to make is Route 66 is a full embedded set of expectations that are already in every one of us. I-94 is much thinner. In my, the way I define in this book, Route 66 is a route. I-94 is a road. It doesn't have that embedded mental aspect. Okay. The usual characterization of routes as trade routes means that we see them as about trade, carrying things from one place to another in some ideal capitalist model. They are exchanged for money or labor or something else in a nice, clean economic model of human behavior. This model simply misses almost everything of what actually happens along a route. Important routes are like Route 66. They're famous in their own time, and they carry enormously more complicated things than trade goods, <coughs> ideas, religions, books, brides, science, prisoners, bandits, human migration, plants, languages, cuisine. Much of what happens on a route is not created in civilization A or civilization B. It's created on the route. As I read for this book, um, the material seemed to, how would I say, resolve itself on a number of axes. And I'll tell you what they are. There will probably only today be time to talk about one or two of them. First was environment or ecology. That is, roots often connected to different ecological zones, and they always have a yearly rhythm, no matter what, where they are or what they connect. There's only a certain time of year, traditionally, when you can move along them, whether because of monsoon winds, um, the rivers freezing, uh, the cold of the Silk Road and such, or the heat of the Sahara in the summer. If ecology is one, two is the material flows. Is there a trade logic to the route? Silk came out of China, reaching a market into the Indian and the Middle East. Similarly, meat and grain from the Midwest reached the East Coast of the United States. Dried fish from the sea coast of Peru goes up into the highlands. Books come from Baghdad or alternatively presses later in the United States. So if that's one and two, three is human networks, which seems to not be re re resolvable into either one of these. Um, we can talk about information flows, physical movement, support systems, and the usual, um, the usual drill of network, social network analysis. Who's on the perimeter, how much it's centralized, what kind of information flows to the, to the outer nodes, and that sort of thing, whether it's family, religion, language, 
region of origin. Think the Marwari networks going off into southern Russia and on and up. Think the Chinese in Southeast Asia. Okay. Another axis that does not seem re resolvable into others is institutional. That is, who controls the route? Or does anybody control the route? What's its relation to government? Um, what's the relation of non-government rest houses to government military installations? What about caravan surveys, bridges, uh, the road itself? Back to Route 66. Think signage. Who's responsible for safety? Um, you know, th think of the standardization of the gauge of American railroads. Who was responsible for that? Think Holiday Inns, for God's sake. You know, they're, the reason they're attractive is because they're utterly predictable for a traveler. And finally, I don't think technology is resolvable into the other axes. Think about a, a route radically changing with the introduction of technology. Um, a forest track becomes the Erie Canal, and it's radically and significantly different from then on. The steamboat in the 1830s made upriver travel on the Rhine um, an order of magnitude cheaper and faster, just as it did on the Mississippi, the Nile, the Indus, uh, not the, uh, the Ganges, and the Yangtze. Now, if we can think of these five axes, I noticed something more, that each of these features have both a mental and a physical component. If there's caravanserais along the route, there's also the information and mental expectation that someone, when they arrive, is going to find one. For the pilgrim, there's the expectation of the wonders he's going to see at the religious destination. I found that it's relatively easy to specify the directly observable features of a route. Climate, the goods traded, the human networks, the technology. It's much more difficult to access the interior perceptions of people centuries or millennia ago. I'm humbled by the process, and I've struggled long and hard with it. My assumption is the best a historian can do um, is utilize what, what travelers wrote, plus songs and stories that are passed down, um, and whatever's created in the visual record to form some kind of rough approximation of these interior mental states. And I assume, um, like all culture, as Komarov and Komarov has reminded us, that it was never wholly accepted. There were different expectations. They were fragmented among groups. They were in competition. They're connected to political and military power and that they change over time. In order to get at this mental side of a root, which is usually not mentioned at all, actually, in most, most literature, I've revisited a subfield of geography known as cognitive geography, behavioral geography, or mental mapping. Um, the roots go back into the 1940s. Probably the most active period, creative period, was the 1970s and 80s. There's still some work going on now. The central insight of this whole subfield was that people's perception of con concepts like near, far, long, short for a journey, a significant landmark or an insignificant landmark, were strikingly different from person to person, from group to group, and radically different from what was portrayed on a standard map. The early, I'm going to just run through a few of the early studies. Kevin Lynch, the Im image of the city, all the way back to 1960. Pocock and Hudson, images of the environment, uh, urban environment, 1978. Geographies of the mind. Um, Downs and Stia, image of the environment, cognitive mapping, and social behavior, spatial behavior. And there's a bunch more. And they've gone through an attempt to map the perception 
of space rather than the space itself. Now, with the, with the sort of positivistic turn in geography, they rather got tractored off in most American geography departments and, and were, uh, ended up much more in Europe than here. Uh, and mental mapping and cognitive geography had been largely subsumed in humanistic geography um, based in France and Germany. Um, there's still much work going on now. For those of us in, in Asia, there are some nice uh, resonances of this now. I remind you of Sumati Ramaswamy's Lost Land of Lemuria, um, Fabulous Geographies and Catastrophic Histories in 2004, and some interesting other work going on, some of it historical, uh, by Rothlaub and Talbert, Geography and Ethnography, Perception of the World in Pre-Modern Societies just last year. I use mental mapping as part of a kind of softer, I'm not looking for quantifiable material. I found the ideas interesting in conceptualizing how people on the same road could have quite different experiences. Um, and in the book I use various terms. I have to say none of them very tightly. I mean I use everything from ethos through perception through reputation, and I try to define it the best I can, to be honest. Um, and what I want to lay out for you is one of the kind of general patterns of the mental side of a root that emerged from the 12 chapters. Okay, the first, oh, you know, I just thought you'd get a kick out of this. Let me just, while we're here. There's Route 66. <laughs> um, why go? All right. Travelers set off for a reason. They always have. Pilgrimage, to see family, to trade in a distant city, to go to war, um, to regain health, to revisit one's birthplace, to gain knowledge. And every traveler has a mental map of the route to his or her destination. And it's composed of rumor, belief, probably some truth, and a whole lot of hooey that's not going to work out for them on the way. They're built these um, until probably right now with the modern ability to look down anywhere in the world through Google Earth, it's been built out of stories retold of people who went before and returned. They're partly accurate, they're partly exaggerated, they're partly entirely made up, um, and for a small literate population you probably have letters and memoirs. Uh, the goal could be personal and entirely idiosyncratic, like returning to a Boy Scout camp from one's youth, or shared with a lot of other travelers, such as pilgrimage. So let's follow one traveler on the Silk Road, a young Buddhist monk who will probably be familiar to many of you named Xuanzang, whose monastery was in the core of China, quote, made up his mind to travel to the West in order to clear his doubts and bring back crucial books from India, the center of Buddhism. A good portion of his cognitive geography, his mental mapping, was actual knowledge of previous trips by Buddhist monks to the West in searches similar to his. For a moment, step forward to Ibn Battuta, who starts out from Morocco in the 14th century on the Hajj. Quote, swayed by an overmastering impulse within me and a long cherished in my bosom to visit these illustrious sanctuaries you can hear the 19th century translation here. So I braced my resolution to qu quit all my dear ones, female and male, and forsook my home as birds forsake their nest. Or, mid-19th mid century, Victor Hugo, starting out on a journey on the Rhine, another chapter in the book. Renovation of ideas and sensations is the object of my journey rather than mere adventure, for which purpose a succession of new objects suffices to me, 
I'm easily contented, provided I have vegetation around me, an air above, a road in view, and a road in the rear. I have nothing to complain of. It seems like it's part expectation about the road or the route and part expectation of the goal that they're trying to get to. And this is cognitive geography that's going to influence all sorts of other stuff along the way. So the next mental step in the journey is not thinking about it, but thinking about departure as an event. Beginning a journey always requires mental transactions and transitions. Leaving friends and familiar environment, gathering needed things, disposing of others, raising money. Most travelers begin their journey in a small group, historically, much more so than alone. In, moder in modern times, it's probably one of the few times that people started out on travel alone. Pilgrims in the Middle Ages received blessings of the local priest and good wishes of the village as they started out. These mental changes, changing from householder to traveler, from lay person to pilgrim, were often reflected in outward show. Um, the stay at home, dressed as they always had. Pilgrims, say, bound for Compostela in western Spain, the second most popular pilgrimage site in in European history, adopted special garb, uh, a cloak, a hat, a staff, and script. They also carried a letter of identity. And I think the cognitive idea that I am different as I step onto this process is reflected many times in a written document. Probably not all pilgrimages, not all traders, but many carry something that identify them. In Europe, it was because if you didn't have that, you were treated as a vagrant, immediately jailed, and tried. In Xuanzang's case, someone unnamed in the memoir um, gave he and his two companions the gear, horses, food, and money. Possibly these were provided by the monastery. We just don't know. Um, and they started off. Victor Hugo, just to loop around back to the mid-19th century journey on the Rhine, he discusses the books he's taking along, including Roman books on the Rhine um, and the clothes that he felt were suitable to the trip. Today we might, what, have a going away party, pack our, cat, our packable hat and our camera and take off. Okay, once one starts on the route, the cognitive geography is often not good enough to, in fact, get there. And the next mental feature that seemed very common in my stories and my research is the guide. It's a prominent feature when the, the traveler steps outside of what he perceives his zone of safety. He hits a part of the road where he doesn't know where the next town is. He doesn't speak the language. He's among people he doesn't trust. <coughs> the cognitive geography requires then a guide. And all of us have had this. We have zones of safety. Going to a familiar grocery store is safe. Sometimes a whole city seems safe, like living and working in London for a few years, and you feel very comfortable with a transportation system. Sometimes the whole, the whole regions feel safe if we speak language fluently. Um, but there are always areas beyond that where we have to enter. The guide adds local knowledge and expertise, his human network and contacts, often language skills, his reputation, and whatever we can find out about his prior, prior honorable or dishonorable actions. He's both gatekeeper and cultural translator. Banditry and disruption was rampant outside the core areas of China, uh, and the New Tang government forbid commoners to travel to the West. And so this was an illegal trip for Xuanzang, and his two companions quickly lost their nerve, turned tail, and left for the, for the monastery back in China. Xuanzang pushes on alone, traveling at night, um, often with covert aid of Buddhist monks and laymen. 
and his guide, who had traveled to the West several times, described the troubles ahead. The Western roads are difficult and bad. Sand streams stretch far and wide. Evil spirits, hot winds when they come cannot be avoided. Numbers of men traveling together are misled and lost. How much rather, sir, you going alone? They avoided seven, uh, four of the seven watchtowers along the road um, where he would have been arrested, and eventually um, his guide abandons him, and Chuan Song lost his way, and wandering three days without food and water, and then in a mystical experience, his horse leads him to the safety of the watchtower. Um, cycling back to Victor Hugo on the Rhine, there were professional guides all over the place. They spoke multiple languages. They knew exactly what romantic visitors wanted. They wanted to see the ruins. They wanted to commune with nature. Um, they explained the history in a very marginal form that emphasized the kind of romantic ruins of the, of the castles around them. They demonstrated whirlpools by throwing in logs, all for a fee, or hiked with the romantic traveler through the mountains from one village to the next, relating history and lore. Um, all of them knew what the traveler's cognitive geography expected, because the travelers were all reading professional guidebooks, which they had left just like us before they left. They knew what sites they needed to see in order to get the real romantic experience on the Rhine. Um, Hugo, Hugo is quite smart and, and has often is able to step back from this with a certain amount of irony and kind of laugh at the construction of romanticism that's going on right in front of him. And he goes to the ruined castle at Bingen um, and discovers that tourists were more willing to pay to see a ruin than they were a restored castle. And he said, I visited the square donjon at Rudemschein, now belonging to an intelligent proprietor who fully understands that in order to remain a palace, it must remain a ruin. <laughs> so he, he, they have tapped directly into the cognitive expectations and geography of a whole class of paying travelers. Okay. If there are places of danger that needed to be passed with a guide, who then also goes on to take you on a walk and through nature to the next village, another milestone in a cognitive map are the havens, the places that are safe and comfortable. Um, for Schwanz, I mean, we've all experienced this. We've been on the road, we've had a rough time, and suddenly, Let's just pay for a room in a good hotel. Let's just, anyone who's traveled outside the limits of, of Europe at least has experienced the moment where you just give in and go to the Istanbul Hilton. <laughs> Shower, air conditioning. My God, I'd forgotten it existed, yes. Anyway, um, this is true of all travelers and it is part of the cognitive geography. Uh, for Xuanzang, it was a Buddhist monastery, the first one, in an independent kingdom located along the caravan track on the southern rim of the Gobi Desert. Um, politically independent, uh, the king actually had traveled to China uh, some years before and heard lectures in Buddhism in the monasteries. And he, in fact, supported several hundred monks in the monastery, even though not Buddhist himself. He certainly had learned how to honor a Buddhist monk from China. When Xuanzang entered the city, I'm quoting here, the king, surrounded by his attendants front and rear, bearing lighted torches, came forth in person to meet him. Having entered the inner hall, Xuanzang took his seat, as did the king, beneath a precious canopy in the pavilion. In the morning, the king ordered food to be provided according to the rules of the religion. By the side of the palace, there was an oratory to which the king himself conducted in Xuanzang, installed him there, and he commissioned certain eunuchs to wait on him and guard him. All of this is 
in Xuanzang's cognitive geography. If he hits a king who knows how to do it, he knows how to respond to it. And the king also has the cognitive expectation that this is what a Buddhist monk is going to want. So that there's a kind of nice mesh there. The king really likes Xuanzang and offers him 100 tails of gold, 30,000 silver coins, 500 rolls of silk to last as his traveling expenses for 20 years, which is what he thought it would take to get to India, learn what he needed to learn, and come back. Probably more important to Xuanzang than all of this, I mean, this was great. This is the way to travel, hire horses, hire some guards, and have the money to do it, was that the king wrote in his own hand 24 letters of introduction to kings on the route to India that he knew about. Right? Do you get it? This is, suddenly, Xuanzang is a notable. He's moved from being a monk on the road to a cognitive expectation of kingly hospitality all the way to India. And what did the king get out of it? Well, in part, Xuanzang wrote a book. <laughs> and it was circulated when he got back to China. And this kingdom figures prominently in him. And this guy's wonderful hospitality becomes noted for probably the entire monastery and perhaps to other monasteries in China that circulated the stories. Places of safety for Victor Hugo, in contrast, were inns. And he loved old, clean, and well-appointed inns. Quote, the kitchen of the king... Uh, the kitchen of the Hotel de Metz is a kitchen worth speaking of. Being an immense hall, one side of which is decorated with rows of saucepans, the other with crockery. In the center, opposite the windows, is a fireplace, a vast cavern containing a splendid fire. The ceiling is traversed by blackened beams from which are suspended different household instruments, hams, and huge flitches of bacon. Mm. OK, let me pause for just a second on, on Xuanzang's travels. Uh, let's leave him at Lake Isikul. Let me go back. Oh, here's a few. This is, this is some, one of the castles that uh, uh, Victor Hugo goes and, and goes to. And this, interestingly enough, is part of how he traveled. Uh, a romantic of the first order, and yet there he is going upriver in a steamboat. Here's the travels of Xuanzang, coming from China, Taklamakan Desert. Here he is up at Lake Isikul. Uh, has a, a lot of famous history, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, the use of silk, which he is granted along here, I've done a book on, and what it suggests is it was not a currency. It was a kind of highly valued honorific used in ceremonies of loyalty and legitimacy. Um, you could trade it for things that you needed, but it was much more important as a cultural sign of being in the upper reaches of whatever society you were in or recognition of your first entry into those reaches. And it is used that way from China all the way across to Turkey, down into India. Um, the use of silk is primarily as an honorific. OK. Um, the king, it is interesting to note that this king and his nobility in receiving Xuanzang wore Chinese silk robes, which can only have come by one hand or another from much further away. For steppe nomad confederations, um, grain and <coughs> silk, which were traded for horses or seized from China, were important for holding together these fragile kingdoms. Nomad leaders uh, traded some of it for iron, but mostly exactly as he did with Xuanzang, 
the presentation of silk robes was an important occasion for nobles to acknowledge their solidarity under a, under a powerful leader beyond immediate kinship or even language. These robes of honor came only from the hand of a successful military leader and then defined a man as suitably attired for court. And by bestowing silk on Xuanzang, um, he again is putting him into a rank um, in some sort of social hierarchy that will be recognized from there all the way to India. The cuisine served at this court also signaled the wealth and hospitality of the king and some sort of shared cognitive geography. The nobles feasted on meat and wine while the king had prepared special vegetarian food for Xuanzang. He lists butter, honey, grapes, rice, and sugar. Certainly rice and sugar grew nowhere in the steppe. These came from China. Rice, probably from China. Sugar, almost certainly from India. Probably came up over the Khyber Pass and through Afghanistan. What's important is, again, cognitively, the king knew what the Buddhist monk ate, and the Buddhist monk was, felt completely safe and comfortable sitting down to meal. Common culture along the route, at this point not being very much disputed, but really reinforced. Um, linguistically, this suggests uh, another aspect of it. There's a dish which we know as, as uh, uh, um, pilaf, pulao, that runs all the way across the Silk Road in various languages. It's pilaf in Iraq, pulao in Iran, pilavi in the Armenian, pilao in Afghanistan, um, pulao in North India, and the same with dumplings. They, they run in, in whatever language they first started, their mantu in China, mantu in Afghanistan and Iran, mandu in Korea, manti in places in Central Asia, momo, all of us have eaten momos, in Tibet. And that suggests a shared cognitive geography. I got a dumpling, you've got a dumpling. I mean, we may not speak the same language, but we speak dumpling. Right? And I think that many things traveling on this route translate into this kind of cognitive geography. Bitter oranges travel all the way to Europe. Saffron moves across in various directions. And I think it forms a kind of cognitive geography. OK, the next step that I want to talk about, and this could come, these could come in any order. You realize I'm not, these are, these are way stations, but they're not a single journey, would be um, the solitary traveler versus group traveling. The comfort zone that you surround yourself with traveling with people who are common to you by language, religion, uh, region, uh, cult, does hardly matters. And typically on these, say, caravans or ships, it can be the same thing. Evenings are time that you trade stories, jokes, gossip. And those are added to the cognitive geography of the traveler right while he's on the route. That, oh, you're going to meet up with Mustafa when you get to, um, you know, someplace over Samarkand. Watch out for that guy. He's as smooth as it comes. You know, he'll take you for everything. And that lore moves back along the route. And it's part of the expectation that's tucked in to the traveler as he goes along. All right. The next, I mean, I talked about places of non-safety. But I think there are also places that are just physically hard. We get extremely spoiled. We get on an airplane, we end up somewhere. When you have to go either in a ship or walking or even on horseback, 
they're places that are incredibly tough. I mean, for Xuanzang, um, he pushes up over the mountains. This is probably a lot, a lot of what Xuanzang looked like. I mean, the area he passed through, this is in a similar area, not too far from, from Isikul. Um, dry riverbeds. Uh, this is an example of what happens when you get irrigation. These are Buddhist caves, see, which would have been right along the route that he was on. And this is the kind of area that he tried to get over. Um, and as he writes, the snow has been changed into glaciers which melt neither in the winter nor summer. The hard frozen sheets of cold water and ice mingle with the clouds. Looking into them, the eye is blinded by the glare. The wind and the snow, driven in confused masses, make it difficult to escape an icy coldness of body through heavy folds of fur-bound garments. Fourteen of the company were starved or frozen to death, while the numbers of oxen and horses that perished was still greater. Um, I think any of us who have traveled in areas have had moments, I certainly have, where American Express is not going to get you out of this one. <laughs> Wave it to your heart's content. It's not going to happen. And there are moments of body awareness. There are moments of danger. There are moments of fear. Um, let me just give you one from my own background. I was searching for an archive, a little family archive on the eastern edge of Rajasthan. I was young and incredibly stupid. Um, I had not been following the newspapers, and I didn't realize that that was a famine area. And I drove, I got off a bus in an obscure village, and there was literally no food. Whoever had it hoarded it. There was no market. There was nothing functioning. And there wasn't a bus for two and a half days. And I kind of looked around, and I, re you know, hi, I have an American Express card, like, don't think so. And I was dependent on the kindness of strangers. A family took me in and fed me some of what they had. And I have to say that it's it touched me so deeply. Um, I tried to write to them. I don't know if the letter ever got there. But it's a moment of discovering just how hard it probably was for earlier travelers. The predictability was low. Um, but for Xuanzang, he made it. And pretty soon, it's a very sad image. This is the one that was blown up by the Taliban. Um, he's in northern Afghanistan, heading down towards uh, India, and immediately he's in a serious Buddhist country. And the sense of, in his memoir, it just leaps through that suddenly he's home. His cognitive geography is being fulfilled. These are places that he has heard about and he knows. Quote, he stops at a monastery. In the hall of the Buddha, there is a water pot. There's a tooth. There's a sweeping brush that the Buddha owned. These three things are brought out every feast day and the priests and laymen draw near to worship them. The most faithful behold a spiritual radiancy proceeding from them. He comments on this very figure, which was in much better nick in 600 than it is now. Um, and everywhere he's asked to discuss doctrine they know how to treat him. They know there's a special place in the monastery where he sleeps. Um, and when he gets down to the plains of India, then he's in the heartland of Buddhism. And his cognitive geography, even though he's never been there, recognizes place after place after place after place. Stupa, monastery. This is the place the Buddha gave this address. This is the place that he and his companions walked. Um, there are hundreds of shrines. Thresholds of steps around these shrines were already deeply worn in 600 um, by pilgrims. 
What was important to him was not markets, towns, trade goods. They never even figure in his memoir. It's the stupas, the shrines, the places where he meets other Buddhists. Let me give you two features of this cognitive geography that are particularly true of pilgrims, and then relate it to a couple of other things. The first is sacred space. In other words, the pilgrim experiences the same space that the one he's trying to honor did something in. The most obvious is the Hajj. On the Hajj, people do a whole series of things that Muhammad did. They throw a stone here, they run there. That's all part of the drill of doing the Hajj. Um, for Xuanzang, as a pilgrim, um, he knows the sacred space well enough, and he is in it. Okay, I'll get to this in a minute. On the Hajj, Ibn Battuta says, for example, at the village of Kulias, the pilgrims make a point of supplying sawik, uh, it's a barley gruel, and bring it with them from Egypt and Syria for this purpose. It's related that the apostle of God, God bless him and give him peace, passed through his place, this place, his companions had no food. So taking some, some of the sand, he gave them the sand, and when they cooked it, they found it to be sawik. By walking where the Muhammad walked and the companions walked, by going to the place where the Buddha rested, you enter this sacred space, as pilgrims say to Compostela on the western coast of Spain. All along the road are phenomena that are associated with Compostela. The stone that the legendary Roland clove, and the pilgrims come up and they whack it as well. And matched to this is sacred time, which conflates the then and the now. And you enter this sacred time by doing the actions that the Buddha or Muhammad or St. James did. And the time is not linear, it's circular. It gets reconstituted each time a pilgrim does the act so that it's endlessly fresh, endlessly immediate, endlessly engaging. And for myself, I mean, I've done a number of pilgrimages in India, and there is this in in intense sense of sweeping up, taking along, doing, for no obvious reason other than everybody else is doing it. We all stop here, we all pick up water here, we pour water here, we go over here, we pour water on this stone. And emotionally, I, I discovered that it was immensely powerful and had this kind of same reaction that my people from older time did. And now this is the last couple milestones on our trip, the arrival. The arrival is rich with cognitive expectation of space, of time, of function. It may fulfill the hopes, it may not. Anyway, after three years of mountains and rivers, of kings and hospitality, Xuanzang arrives at Nalanda Monastery, at which at that point there were 10,000 monks in a variety of residences. Let me have some pictures of this. Well, this is a typical stupa that he would have worshipped at. And here's Nalanda as it more or less exists now. Um, and all these little cells back here, those are all monk cells. And he would have occupied one of those. He found a teacher of the text he wanted. He stayed for five years and then traveled through southern India listening to Buddhist and Brahmanic teachings uh, and then went back to China. He said, I have visited and endured, adored the sacred vestiges of our religion, heard the profound expositions of the various schools. My mind has been overjoyed. My visit here has, I protest, been of the utmost profit. I desire now to go back and translate and explain to others what I have heard. So that his 
cognitive geography now includes the entire way back to China in detail as he's done it, and he knows what it takes, and he's prepared to do it. Um, a king from this Nalanda region funded the entire return expedition across Central Asia. He carried 655 books, a dozen relics and statues, um, and each of these would become the center of a shrine in China. Now, some conclusions. Where are we in time-wise? Does anybody? Are we okay for just another couple minutes? Okay. I want to disabuse you of two things. First, um, this sequence that I've laid out of possible cognitive geography was not intended to be linear. I mean, it started and it finished, but everything else can be in any order. There are types of milestones along the way, but they're not mile by mile. The second is I don't want to give the impression that I'm going all Joseph Campbell-y here, that, that all sagas are the same, that all hero quests are the same, uh, regardless of where they appear. And what saves this analysis of cognitive geography, um, with that fundamental insight that prior expectations lead people on a route literally to experience it, value it, and record it entirely differently. Um, Joseph Campbell smears out difference, um, and I want to emphasize difference in the connection to the specifics of the route. Let me just re recall again that environmental, the human networks, the institutional structures, the technology, those are all very specific and very specific to the root. Um, I can, at your, I mean, for example, that yearly rhythm or institutional structures along the way, uh, I can at this point do a couple of things. I have a little bit more on silk robing, which if you would like, I would be happy to talk about, but I think my preference would be to just stop and start talking about some of the stuff that seems to tweak you. Thank you. Yeah, go. Yeah, I was interested in what you had to say about, about pilgrimages. About? About pilgrimages. Pilgrimages, yes. About specifically religious types of travels. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and I noticed that in a lot of religious traditions, and the gift of Buddhism and actually ancient Greek rituals and rites of initiation, there, there are a lot of practices where the person is stable and fixed and doesn't actually physically go anywhere. But the way that the Enlightenment is described is through metaphors of traveling, you know, of, of reaching high spaces, you know, even descriptions of the afterlife in ancient Greece is described as a trip down, you know, it's down the river, you see like this type of a tree next to you this, next to you that. And so I'm wondering what, you know, if there's a connection between actual pilgrimages and these sorts of more metaphorical, spiritual types of descriptions that seem to borrow the metaphors of, mm. of travel logs. And, and um, absolutely. I mean, yeah. so many come right to mind. Uh, so let's start with some of them. Um, meditating on my Mount Kailash. So th a a a as what? Uh, the 60s rock and roll movie, Queen. Oh, it was Moody Blues. Thinking is the best way to travel. Um, so that by meditating on Mount Kailash, you travel to Mount Kailash. And that's part of both a Hindu tradition and a Buddhist tradition. Um, there are lots more of those, though. For example, there are little, for the Christian tradition in Europe, Compostela spins off other Saint-Jacques chapels and religious institutions all across Europe so that if you can't get to the big one in Spain, you can get to the little local one. And it's spiritually connected with 
heavy voltage wire, you know, direct to the local. And it's just, it's maybe not just as good, but it's almost as good. And you don't travel at all. Um, I think pilgrimage, long distance pilgrimage, was relatively rare until probably the 19th century. Pilgrimage of 20, 30 miles, probably fairly common, but the people who actually traveled from to the big shrines, I don't think they were coming from huge distances, large numbers of them. It's too expensive. People who went off to Compostela wrote wills as their normal process before they left. Think what that does to your cognitive geography. <laughs> One way trip. <laughs> anyway, so I think you're right that there are many, many suggested alternatives that are pilgrimage E, but don't require travel. Right. And I, I, I was wondering if within the tradition, you know, that those sort of narratives of, of initiation and enlightenment mirror the actual landscape of those cultures. Well, let me suggest the same, you yeah. know, the same kind of vocabulary or tropes. There's some interesting recent research. Um, a group got together that worked, um, I don't know if this will be familiar to many people, uh, ancient play in India called The Cloud Messenger. Um, it's one of the most famous plays in, in early India. And uh, its structure is very simple. Um, the beloved is longing for the lover. The lover is way far away. And the beloved enlists a cloud to carry the message of how much she loves him. He loves her. I can't remember which is. It, it varies from region to region actually. And they are found uh, both in India proper in various places and they're also found in Sri Lanka. The same rough story. Uh, but the geography is utterly different. And in one case they can actually trace the geography of where the cloud is going to get sent and there's nothing about coming back. In, in another one all the cloud is supposed to do is go around to the principal Hindu shrines in the south and somehow it'll, it's, it builds up enough spiritual energy, it'll find the lover. <laughs> the, the Sri Lankan one, it's supposed to start off in the lowlands and drop in on all the major monasteries and end up in the Tamil area in the north. And the geography is utterly different. It's the same story. And that suggests that there are competing or very differing um, cognitive geography of this process in different regions of India. So it really is an interesting um, opening into a whole new way of looking at comparative literature and that sort of thing. So I think that it's very rich. Others? Yes? Um, why do you think that you can't, that there isn't a cognitive geography for I-94, like there is for 66? Oh, it's there. I think it's more threadbare. That's all. I think that it's, it is, because I was defining these major roots that I'm using in comparison, they're very dense, very culturally rich. I mean, one of them, for God's sake, is the Appian Way. And you know, with all the overtones of all the people who marched along it and the wars that started out from there and such. Um, and I-94 is less of a route and more threadbare in its associations. That's all. Yes? If, in light of what you're saying about guides, if I were to decide I wanted to walk the Appalachian Trail, mm -hmm. Would you recommend that I engage a guide? Absolutely. There are moments, uh, I, I have a good friend who's done it, and there are moments way out beyond anything you can anticipate. Weather, animals, strangeness, yeah. I think that it, and maybe not for the whole length, 
but certainly get, it, get some feedback from people who have done it, and there are sections of it that you probably want help. I've had, I've had the same question actually about uh, Route 66 and mm -hmm. Route 94. Because when, when I was thinking about Route 66, what I'm imagining I think is very much the product of a concerted effort at advertising, mm -hmm. right? So it isn't, is it, you know, and it's, uh, it's an imagination of the past, right? And then mm -hmm. from Chicago to Albuquerque thousands and thousands of times along that route, right? But it, it's, a, it's a marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. So can you speculate or talk a little bit more about the role of kind of government or other kind of authorized right. cultural production and the imagination of these routes? You know, oh. What makes the Silk Road? Great question. Like Roots that. as marketing. Um, let's start with <coughs> Compostela, just for... Compostela started as a small regional shrine um, with no kingly patronage and one king got together with one head of this shrine and said, basically they said, I can make you if you can make me. The king committed money to the shrine. The head guy made an absolutely audacious, outrageous claim, which is that the uh, bones of Saint-Jacques, of, of um, the companions, that would be companion of Christ. Anyway, who never left um, the Holy Land had mysteriously turned up in far western Spain. And they went on an ad advertising campaign to sell this. And they succeeded. They gradually brought various people on board for the widest ranges of political and, and, and military and economic reasons and the Pope tried to quash it and couldn't. And finally the Pope recognized them. And it was a really conscious advertising effort uh, which hugely benefited the shrine and this king who then taxed the people who were coming to the shrine. Um, and I think that there's certainly that about a whole bunch of routes. We could, I mean, the Hodge also has its elements of, a, of an early advertising campaign. Um, and no doubt about it that part of what Nalanda, the Buddhist university, did so well was to send out people it trained who spoke well of it. Um, I think that, that the two aspects are probably not separable. And I think we have a wide variety of images of, of Route 66 because of the television program, you know, the, and the uh, conscious attempt to promote Route 66 of these little dying towns along the way, um, and that that is in fact a feature of Roots. As when I started, I said it's partly truth, it's partly told stories, it's partly hooey. And the advertising campaign is part of the part of the process. I think you're quite right. Other questions? Yes. I, was in, <coughs> I spent ten weeks in, <coughs> excuse me, in China uh, in the summer of 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, I was mostly in Shanghai, but one weekend I uh, flew to Ningxia, uh, the capital of the Ningxia province in northwest China. Oh, yeah, yeah. And okay. uh, a Chinese friend uh, took me on a tour of the province, and I had a lot of, a lot of experiences, of new experiences, rode on the uh, raft in the Yellow River. Mm -hmm. And I rode on a camel in the desert, and I didn't know there were camels in China. And then uh, in the city of Yinchuan, I visited a mosque, and I looked you know, from the outside and saw a large group of men wearing it traditional Muslim uh, clothing and doing their traditional prayers. And they were Chinese <coughs> men. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I, it's such a busy weekend, I didn't ask some of the questions I should have asked, but I speculated that Arabs must have come along the silk tra trail with camels that they traded for silk and other goods, and that they also somehow proselytized some of the 
made of Chinese. Sure, you're, you're describing historically pretty much what happened. That the, the, Both of these routes, let me go back to the very beginning. Um, oh, well this was, this was a little demonstration of monasteries that were connected to Nalanda around between 400 and 1,000, so they're all over here. All those red dots have some direct either exchange of scholar, exchange of teacher um, going on. It was just a demonstration of a kind of world. Anyway, um, yeah, very active trade this way as well as this way. I mean, you have mosques in China as early as uh, nine, certainly 900. You have plenty of stories of Arab traders making it to the Chinese coast as early as 850. Um, and across this way, it's just a, it's fairly continuous. It, it, it seems to rise or fall some depending on the, on the dynasty and how how organized or disorganized it is, but that road continues and the road down into India. So what you were seeing was, was spot on, was absolutely correct. Uh, and all kinds of stuff moved across there. One little example. You can look at Persian painting and you'll see a motif that goes over, up, over, down. It's called a cloud lift pattern and it comes directly from China and it's traded as a motif all the way across and ends up in Iran as a common motif. Um, the same with those strange funny rocks that are at the back of Mughal painting, Iranian painting, Central Asian painting, and curiously enough, Chinese painting. So that the, the artistic connections are very much uh, in place. Yes? Oh, I see the red dots in Indonesia. And that reminded me that the largest population of Muslims is in Indonesia. Correct. Could you talk a little bit about the root of how that, Islam spread? Yes, in indeed, Indonesia? sure. That starts. Um, probably in Yemen, uh, and they're, they're noted for being traders. Uh, pick it up about, say, the year 1000. You don't, you get Arab traders along here. Um, you get expeditions to Sri Lanka. You already have some colonizing in Sumatra and living in Java. Um, they're mixed, they're small groups of Muslims, mostly trading communities. Um, we know about them only almost from gravestones. Uh, they've turned up a number of gravestones um, on Java that are early uh, Islamic. The Buddhism in these areas is much more direct. I mean, we have all the evidence in the world that you would want. For example, um, right about there, a ship went down in the year 1000, um, probably in a storm. You know, it, it, went, it went straight to the bottom. It's a perfectly smooth uh, seafloor there. It sat there for 2,000 years and no, a thousand, a thousand years, sorry, um, and was discovered in 1998 uh, by an Australian Singapore team. This, the ship, all the, all the timbers were gone, but everything that the ship had on it was intact. And it painted a picture of this trading world that was just astonishing. There were mirrors from South China which required tin from Malaysia. There were copies of the Chinese mirrors done cheaper quality in Sumatra on their way to Java. There were bronze 
doors for a monastery from Bengal on their way to Java made with tin from Malaysia, from Malaya. Um, there were the farthest distance, just to sum this up, not to, not to kind of stretch this out, the neatest thing they found was glassware from Syria. It was not intact. They tried to put it all back together and they had everything. It didn't go together. It was broken glassware. They were peddling it into Java to remelt into beads, which some of which have turned up in Java still in families. They were also shipping blue eye beads from Iran, which are still made in Iran because they use minerals from that area and they did chemical analysis on them, they had definitely come from Iran. So by a thousand, this is a whole networked world, both Buddhism, Islam, and trade. Yes? Can you mention Alexander? I can. His, uh, yeah. Contributions? Right. I mean, the, the, the invasion across um, into North India, or almost North India, and back left a kind of Greco world, which is documented in coins, sculpture. Uh, actually, this last weekend, I was at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and they have one of the slam dunk, wonderful Gandharan sculptures with the kind of Roman toga, Greek-looking toga, mustaches and stuff. Anyway, but that's another whole cultural part of that world. I just add that I first encountered that in Luoyang, oh, where yeah. there are giant Buddhas. Uh, that's only a few hours from right. Xi'an, uh, yeah. from Chang'an, the ancient capital, and the giant Buddhas with their togas, yeah, right yeah. to the Tang era with nice, fat, chubby, self-satisfied. Yeah, correct. They ate well. <laughs> Thank you.